All right, guys. Well, here we are, and it is later that night. Um, I I know, I know. We've already gone over it. There's no need to go over this further. It has been a rough month. I just want to, you know, kind of dust myself off, take it on the chin, and move forward. I think that's the best course of action. Um, the first week of May, somewhere in the beginning of May, the um, two-hour cut for my documentary will be done by Lucas. Now, by no means will it be done by that point. Um, I needed $60,000 to complete the film. 30000 is still needed. I was able to raise thirty grand in the last two weeks or so, and I still need another thirty to get it done. Uh, but we will have a two-hour rough cut coming up in the first week of May or so. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it because I've been in the dark. You know, I haven't seen anything. They're not letting me see anything. Like, if I ask them, they're like, you're a bitch. I'm like, all right. They block me. And then I call from Karina's number. I was like, hey, it's not Ryan. What's up? And they're like, shut up fuck you you're the subject you can't just be all up in our business and i get it i understand what the point of kind of keeping me um out of it is you know because i want to portray myself as a hot tan dude and that's not always what i am i thought that's what i was no no ryan no so i'm looking forward to that and then on may 5th i'm proposing to karina but I'm excited about that. I do love her. She's probably going to say no, though. She's like, what are you talking about? We've been fighting every day. Why don't we marry you? You're fucking, you're a nobody. I hope you go back to prison someday. Oh, you don't mean that. What if I did? I love you so much, poo, -poo daddy. Anyway. Um. What else? I don't know. I'm just trying to get in the right headspace to be able to do a video. And I'm just trying to get back into that mode. So I think maybe instead of doing an introduction, I'll just get right into the motherfucking story. Let's try that. There. Sorry. Sorry I've been such a schizo lately. I did start smoking marijuana again yesterday. That was Karina's suggestion because I've been such a fucking basket case. And I got this stuff right here. Um... That's what it comes in. It looks like rolling tobacco, but it's weed. And it comes with papers. And it's actually really good. It's a good uh, indica sativa hybrid. Um, but I smoke it only at night. I never smoke in the day. And I never smoke um, if I have to drive. Like, I will not drive stone. I'm actually against that. Of all the dirtbag shit that I've ever done, one thing that I really am against is driving under the influence. I know that sounds weird because I'm just such a piece of shit in so many other areas in life, but I don't, at this point, I don't drive under the influence, even a marijuana. Call me old fashioned, but I, I just don't like to do it. I started smoking weed yesterday because, um, you know, Karina just said that my mental health got to a place that was where it's not manageable. I got, I started getting really weird and paranoid, you know, um, I will go into it when it's not so soon. I'll, I'll talk about some of the weird things that I've done, but they're weird, you know, um, so I started smoking weed again yesterday. And you know what? I woke up today and we had just a much better day. I told Karina, I said, look, we need to kiss more. She's like, what do you mean kiss more? I was like, I mean, like we need to kiss more. We need to be more affectionate to each other. She's like, okay. And then we kissed. And now we're kissing a lot. It's like this new thing we're into. Like if we even like make eye contact, we kiss now. And we don't say anything. I'm like, just don't ever talk about this again. We'll do it again if we make eye contact. All right, all right, I gotta go. Um, so I did start smoking weed again. I tried to go fully sober, and it didn't. My mental health stuff started like really like kind of peaking. Like, I just started being weird. I started being a a weirdo, really weird. I was like, uh. uh how many dudes have you fucked? Just, just tell me the truth. Come on. I promise I won't hold it against you. She's like 109. I'm like, oh, 109 dudes? What about girls? How many girls? Five? 
six. She's like, no girls. I'm like, oh. Stuff like that. Uh, I will talk about it more in a more serious way when I'm ready to, but um, I started getting really weird again. So I smoked weed, and it helped me. I woke up today, I was in a way better mood. We kissed a bunch, and tonight we're probably going to have sex again. Maybe. I don't know. We didn't fight today, though. So you're probably like, well, good job. I thought you were getting right into the story, you fucking clown. Do it. Dance. Here I go. So this is going to be the Henry story. It's a story that I should have wrapped up, you know, a while ago. And it's interesting because it's it's part of a period that Karina doesn't like me talking about. You know, there's certain things that I talk about when I do my videos that she's not comfortable with me talking about to other people. And I've only had one situation that I can think of where I told a story and the person that the story was about caught wind of it and told me to stop and didn't want me to complete the story and that was the about the dude dave that had raped jenny and what we had done to get revenge on that guy i i gave i promised that i wouldn't tell the dude what had happened this particular story with henry karina doesn't really want me there's certain aspects of it she doesn't want me to talk about. So I'm just going to do it anyway because I don't give a fuck. Fuck our relationship. It sucks anyway. No. I'm going to try to censor it to some degree. But um, that's kind of the deal with it. That's kind of why I'd stop for a second. I don't remember where we had left off last time. But Preston was the guy that I was talking about that had got me into that treatment center in Orange County. So Preston had pretty much... In high school, once I got him onto meth, we were talking about this in a different story last night. I don't want to confuse you guys too much, but he really went down the tubes on drugs. Got into meth, he got into heroin, and he was always one of those guys that acts like he's not using when he is. He'd weigh like 110 pounds. He'd like show up at your fucking house wearing a bathrobe at like two in the morning. He'd be like, do you have any half and half, dog? I'm like, no. Like, are, are you sober? Yeah, I'm going to go sleep in my camper. Just wondering if you had half and half. I got to go, man. It's like one of those kind of guys. I know everybody has a friend like that where you can tell that they're loaded, but they'll lie to you about it. That was him. So he kind of went off and did his own thing. Um, I went to prison for five years. And I will say this. When I was in federal prison the first time, Preston was an unbelievably good friend to me. Sent me money all the time, you know, like 40 bucks would hit my books. Sometimes he sent me a hundred, whatever. Got me all these subscriptions to like right-wing extremist um, publications. It was like, why black people are taking over the public school system? And I'd be like reading it. I'd be like, what the fuck is this? And then like some black dude would be walking by and be like, hey man. You guys are taking over the, you know, you guys are taking over the private schools too. But it's not just us with the public schools here. It would get me in like a lot of trouble and shit. I'd be like, what the fuck? You know, he'd send me like pretty much low key racist shit. He knew, he, because at that time, before I'd gone to prison, uh, I was doing volunteer work for the Obama administration because I bought into Obama's bullshit. And I don't want to get into politics, but I'm apolitical now. I don't care. Both sides are the same to me. But at that time, I was all about Obama, and he hated that. And a lot of my friends hated the fact that I liked Obama so much. They just thought that I was a bitch. You know, I, I don't know the conversation they had behind my back, but I imagine it was something like this. Hey, you talked to Ryan lately? No. Nah. Why not? Well, I don't know. I heard he's a bitch. Oh, yeah, I agree. Let's not talk about him anymore. Never again. All right, cool. It was like shit like that. My friends had like pretty much like turned their back on me uh, over that, over the fact that I was like such a big Obama supporter. But I had friends like Preston that I'd been friends with for years and years and years. So it was like kind of like tongue in cheek. He'd send me this like right wing racial like newsletter shit while I was in prison. It's kind of like a joke. Like, hey, fuck you, you Obama liberal loving queer. And I'd be like, oh, I'm going to read it just because my friends said it. But I don't believe in any of this. It was that kind of thing. While I was in there, 
he went through his own trials and tribulations with drug addiction. But that was the period where I think he stopped being honest with me about what he was doing. You know, I'd like call him and I could hear it in his voice. It'd be raspy. I could tell that he was on drugs. And I'd be like, hey, man, are you doing all right? He'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to think about, you know, sleep. But kind of like in a mathematical sense, if you know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to equate the days that I've spent up with the days that I haven't spent alive. And if you get the difference, then you know when you can go to sleep exactly. I'm like, oh, so you're sober. He's like, yeah, that's pretty much what I was trying to say. I was like, oh, okay, cool. When I got out of prison in 2013, it was interesting because he was sober. Jeff was sober. My friend Max was sober. Paul was sober. All of my best friends were sober at that point. And then you know the story. I went on. I got engaged. Wasting Talent came out. I was buff with a small dick. I was on paleo. I was like one of those guys where I was like, no, I don't eat processed food. And I just became a pretentious, sober asshole. It got to a point where I would get mad at people if they used or drank in front of me. I don't know if I ever told you this story, but Jeff, when I first got out of prison, he was my best friend at that point. We're not talking right now. Still, because he told me that Nico was going to grow up to be a junkie. He's like, you already have one kid that's going to grow up to be a junkie. Why do you need another one? Fuck that. I'm not going to, like... The way he said it, there was like, like, it's like, man, you're not going to talk about my child that way. And he had no remorse. We have not talked since. But when I first got out, he was my best friend. We would talk like little schoolgirls all night long. We'd fall asleep with each other on the phone. You know that kind of shit where you're talking to someone so late night that you guys both just start like nodding out and saying random shit. And then you, you pass out and that's it. We would do that every single night made up for all this last lost time i love talking to him i talked to him for hours on end and sometimes i do miss the guy he was working at a spiritual boutique store whatever the fuck that is but he that's where the gay psychic worked too and he would tell me about it i'm like what do you do he's like yeah you know we sell we, we sell new age stuff you know we, we sell like chakra like like measuring rocks you know, chakra measuring stones, you know, so you can quantify how, how your chakra is feeling at the time. I didn't even know what that was. I thought that was like a Hawaiian surf gang. I was like, what the fuck is a chakra? But he was all into this like new age yoga shit. He's like, yeah, I've been hanging out with this guy, George. He's a gay psychic. He's fucking dope. He tells me that he predicts that he'll talk me into, you know, letting him suck my dick at some point. I'm like, he sounds like a great guy. He's like, he is. He's really on point. While he was there, and I always have had the slight suspicion that Jeff was a suppressed homosexual. That's not even a joke. Every time I bring that up to him, he'll just smile. I don't care if he is. And I've told him that. I was like, man, I love you no matter what. I don't give a fuck who you have sex with. But he will, he'll never admit it. I don't know. He's dated girls. So maybe I'm just being presumptuous. But at this particular time... There was a girl that was working for him named Callan. I never liked this girl. And I hadn't met her at this point. But he told me that he's, he's some young girl had started working there. And he said that she was really cute. And then he thought that he, you know, had a thing for her. I never heard him talk about any women like that. I never heard him say that a girl was cute, ever. Like I've never heard him say that. I was like, well, how old is she? Jesus Christ. I mean, she's of age, right? He's like, yeah, weirdo. She's like 21. Now, she was like 21. I was 28 at the time. He was 29. I've always prided myself as somebody, and I know this sounds lame. I don't want to sound lame to you, but I don't really care. It's We've known each other for so long now. It doesn't matter. But I'd say that I probably have game you know, with women texting, not in real life. Once women see me, they're like, you know, that guy's disgusting. He has gingivitis. But like through texting, through messaging, through Tinder fucking connecting, I always was able to talk to women pretty well. 
better than a lot of my friends that were like, um, didn't know what to say, you know, they'd be like, Hey, how are you? Good. What kind of stuff are you into? Oh, I don't know. What about you? And then they, like my friend will send him a dick shot. This kind of shit. Hello? And then they never talk to him again. Me, I, you know, I don't know. I was, I, somehow I had like mastered the art of what to say to women. Like to reel them in. I was good at getting girls. I was never good at keeping them. Because once women would find out what kind of guy I really was, self-obsessed, narcissistic, bad hygiene, nymphomaniac, perverted, drug addicted. They got over it, right? But getting them initially, I was always pretty good at that. So he's talking to her one night. One night, Jeff and I are having one of our like many late night conversations. And he's like, dude, she just texted me and she said that she's having problems with her boyfriend. What do you think that means? I'm like, well, in my experience, when a girl does that, it probably means that she wants to fuck you. He's like, no. God, Ryan, you always, it's, do you know how predatory you sound right now? You sound like a goddamn predator. I'm like, no, you have a girl text messaging you at two in the morning, complaining to you about her boyfriend. She wants to have sex with you. Sorry, that's what it means. Sorry to break it to you, fucking weirdo. He's like, what do I say to her? I don't know what to say. Should I send her a dick shot? I'm like, look, dude. This is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to... I am going to spit the game for you. I'll send... I will tell you what to send to her. While we're on the phone, you send it. And when she does the replies... I will do the responses and tell you to text them. I'm going to get you this girl. Oh, I promise you that. I don't remember what I said to her, but I, 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 I went in for the kill. You know, it's like she, I'm like, all right, get her to start talking about her boyfriend. What doesn't she like about him? So he's like sending me screenshots and I'm like, all right, say this. It's probably an inappropriate time to tell you this, but. Every time you pass me at work, I get butterflies. In fact, it reminds me of when I was a kid and I used to go to school and I used to have a crush on a girl. You literally make every single day that I go to work something I'm excited about. Enter. I'm like sipping coffee. I'm like the Mad Hatter. I'm like, well, I'm just filming. I was getting all into it. I was like, yeah, fucking, you know, I'm just fucking sticking her butt in my head. So he's, he's like relaying this game, right? That I'm like composing for him. Finally, he sends me a text message and he goes, dude, it worked. She just sent me an address. What do I do? I'm pretty tired. I'm like tired. I was like, you get off the phone with me. You go take a shower and you go and you fuck this girl. That's what you do. Be a man. Jesus Christ. He's like, okay. Anything else? I was like, no. Jesus Christ, dude. You're fucking 29 years old. I shouldn't have to tell you how to do shit like this. He ends up having sex with her, right? And Jeff's got a hammer cock. He does. I've seen it. I've like taken saunas with him and I'm, I'm like licking. He's like, can you stop? I'm like, no, I can't. Not gonna lie. The thing is fucking insanely big. Can I ask you something? He's like, yeah. Is it painful to get erections when it's that big? He's like, no, it's not. No, I didn't say shit like that. He ends up dating this girl. This girl leaves her boyfriend for Jeff. Or for... She leaves her boyfriend for Jeff. They start dating. I never met her. And it becomes this thing where... I'd never seen Jeff like this. He's giddy. He's in love. 
He's like, I'm thinking about getting her name tattooed on my wrist. I was like, yeah, dude, you're a John. You've known the girl like three weeks. Jesus Christ. It made me sick. I was nauseated. I was mad. It was like, I felt like I created this fucking monster and I had to deal with all this corny shit. You know, he'd like send me like songs on YouTube. He'd be like, dude, this one really reminds me of her. I was like, Jesus, bro. And at that point, I was on house arrest. I had just done five years in prison. I was not... I was a pig at that point because I was trying to make up for lost time. I didn't care. I wasn't trying to be sweet to anybody. When I, when I, and, and I learned, look, I got it out of my system at that point. And I realized that I don't like sleeping around like that. I don't like feeling empty. If I have sex with someone, I like to connect with them. I like to love them. You know, I like being in a relationship where I love the person, we have good sex. She's a good example of that. Don't let the adult toys that I showed you earlier make you think any differently. We have a phenomenal sex life and I care about her. And when you're with somebody that you care about, it's just a million times more meaningful and it's just a, a hundred times better. I saw this dude fall off the fucking deep end with this girl. He was never the kind of guy that had, like, crazy, wild, passionate love affairs, you know? In high school, he was not the best-looking guy. He, I'm trying to think of a non-mean way to say it. I can't, so I'm just not. But he just, well, he wasn't a great-looking guy in high school, I'd find out later that he was very insecure about this. You know, he got healthy. He got in good shape. He got much better looking as he got older. But back in high school, he was not good looking. And he was mad. He was like one of those people that was not good looking. He was mad about it. He'd probably like look at himself in the mirror before school. Fucking head butted and cracking. I fucking hate you, ugly. I don't know if it was to that degree. But you know what I'm saying. And I remember he dated this girl named Rose that he had met on AOL chat room. And he kept her secret for years. He was fucking this girl named Rose for years. Three, four, five years before anybody knew about it. It was weird. I felt like he was going to gay bathhouses or something. It was like on that level. And I'd gotten in a fight at a party one time in Isla Vista, the college town outside of Santa Barbara. And I called him and I was like, dude, I'm fucking stranded. All these frat boys are trying to kill me. Can you come get me? And he didn't have a car at the time. He's like, yeah, my girlfriend and I'll come get you. I'm like, girlfriend? What the fuck? I thought you were like... I don't know what I thought he was. That I didn't know that he... I was like, I didn't... I know you like girls. Me too, dog. Come get me. So he picks me up with this girl, Rose. Now, Rose was not bad looking. She's not great looking. She was just kind of like your mill of the mill girl, right? And I've never really been shallow, you know? I'm like, personality for me, honestly, I know like everybody says this so they don't sound like a piece of shit. Personality always goes a big way for me. Jenny was not a very good looking girl, but she had a great personality, right? Bomb personalities go a long way. And Rose had a great personality. But she wasn't the best looking, but she wasn't ugly either. And he was mean to her, you know? And so he was with her for like five years, got her strung out on heroin. Her dad was a preacher, gave like, you know, he was like a, I don't even know how to say it. He was one of those uh, TV angelicists or whatever that would like do sermons on TV and like get donations and shit. And he was a heroin addict. This guy shot heroin. The heroin shooting preacher that Jeff's girlfriend, that was Jeff's girlfriend's dad, and they all lived together down by San Bernardino and shot heroin together. It was very odd. We can go, that's an entirely different story, but it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. Rose, he was with for about five years, and he cheated on her, and I don't remember what ultimately broke up that relationship, but something had there was a couple girls that he dated not very seriously couple you know two three months at a time and then there was this new girl Callan who to be fair I'm the one that got her 
with my words. Like I reeled her in. I, I don't remember what I said, but it was a lot better than, hey, how are you? Oh, here's a picture of my cock. Oh, she didn't write back. Weird. You know, that seems to be the game that a lot of guys have these days. So I never met her. Now, the point of what I'm saying, this all has to do with the story that I'm telling. There's a reason I'm going into all of this shit right now. At that time, like I said, I had been sober now for over a year. I was dating Casey, who would, was the girl I was with for two years. We had a serious relationship. And I've been sober over a year. She had been sober like eight or nine months. And Jeff said that he had been sober for like three years. Preston, same thing. All my friends have been sober for years. I'm at my parents' house in Jeffson town with his girlfriend, Cal, the one that I've never met, but I helped get. She comes over and hates a strong word, but I fucking hated this cunt. I hated her. I fucking hated her. From the second that I met her, I hated this fucking bitch. I hated her. I'm sorry for the language. Fucking horror. She had chipmunk. She had, she looked like a fucking chipmunk. She looked like Chucky. Hey, I'm Callan. I was like, ew, it looks like you're fucking a Disney character. Seriously, it was fucking gross. But again, I'm not shallow. So let's go, let's talk about how bunk this girl's personality was. So I meet her and... My girlfriend at the time, Casey, her dad's a really bad alcoholic. Casey was a bad alcoholic. We're all on the wagon. It's all hunky-dory, whatever. Jeff brings Callan over to my house. And right away, just her chipmunk face bothered me. She's like, hey. I was like, hey, I'm Ryan. She's like, I know who you are. Jeff said you had treasures over here. I was like, treasures? The I look at him, I was like, what do you mean by that? He's like, show her some of your memorabilia that you have from when you were a drug dealer. Some of your signed blotter acid, you know, some of your signed Hunter S. Thompson stuff. Some of your, like, diary pages from Janis Joplin. Some of your Salvador Dali lithographs. Some of your Warhol shit. I look at him, I was like, I was like, really? Treasures? All right, Callan, I'll show you my treasures. We go into my room and I'm showing her the stuff and she's rolling her fucking eyes at my treasures. Now, I'd never considered that the stuff that I had was treasures to begin with, but I have to admit it was a bit offensive that she wasn't into what I had. She didn't seem to care. It was like one of the things where Jeff was trying to impress her, but he was like completely tone deaf and didn't realize that this girl just didn't give a fuck. She was some narcissistic chipmunk, know-it-all, that just was hideous inside and out. Then she asks for wine. She's like, do you have any wine? I like to drink wine when I'm looking at treasures. I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, no, I don't have wine. I said, you know what? I don't have wine. And you know, I'll tell you why I don't have wine, because I'm sober. I am sober. She's like, sober from what? Wine. You can't even get addicted to wine. Now, Casey, my girl at the time, who would later become my fiance, was a pretty confrontational person. She was very combative, very hostile, very kind of angry person. And she went off on this chick. And she's like, listen. She's like, we are in recovery. We don't want to be about around fucking wine. Ryan doesn't have wine. His parents doesn't have wine. And we don't want people drinking wine in front of us. She's like, okay, wait a second. My sister is addicted to crystal meth. So don't try to tell me about addiction because you guys don't know shit about it. I know about it because my sister is addicted to crystal meth. And your treasures fucking suck. Look at Jeff. I was like, get... I was like, get this bitch out of my house. 
I don't know anything about uh, addiction. I'm not on fucking federal probation because I just served five years for selling heroin. Oh, yeah. I don't know nothing about addiction. But 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 Chipmunk does because her sister is addicted to crystal meth. Get out of my house. So she leaves. I had never seen Jeff so blindly in love in his life. It was annoying. The shit that he would say just bugged me. He'd be like, you know how when you're in love, when you wake up in the morning, the clouds seem a little bit more, I don't know, obscured by feelings. I'd be like, can you please not ever fucking say stuff like that to me again, man? Because I love you and I don't want that to, to, to go away. All right. So I try to give this girl another chance because he loved her so much. Second time I, I, I met her. By this point, we had gotten a condo down in Encino. I'm sober. I'm doing great. Go to 24-hour fitness five times a week. I'm on the paleo diet. I'm very anti-drugs and alcohol at that point in my life. I'm not even around people that smoke weed because I'd become that guy. I'd become that guy that got off drugs and then I wanted to judge people that smoked weed. I'd be like, you know, Manson smoked pot. We all know how that fucking story turned out. It made people uncomfortable. My sober Nazism. So she comes over with Jeff one night and we're going to go see a movie. I forget what we're going to see. But they come down and we go out for a nice dinner. She orders wine at the dinner. This is after the first fucking debacle where, where I had like kicked her out of my house over the wine thing. She's like, can I get your best red? Thanks. I'm like, I looked at, um, at, uh, at Casey and I was like, God, I was like, I bet the chipmunk needs acorns too. You fucking chipmunk slut. Jeff was so into this girl too. It was gross. Like, write her poems with crayons on the fucking napkin. She'd be like, oh my god. He's so sweet to me. I bet your guy's not sweet to you because he knows nothing about addiction. Because my sister is addicted to crystal meth. I swear to God you'd say shit like this. Okay, so... She drinks wine at dinner and Casey gets mad because Casey was more of an alcoholic than me, at least at that point. Yes, it's true. In 2016, uh, you know, after Casey had left me, I became a raging alcoholic. But at that point, I didn't really even have a problem with people drinking in front of me, but Casey did. So I took offense to it. So anyway, so she drinks the wine and Casey's just mad dogging her the whole time. And Jeff's just like, isn't my chick right? I'm like, no, she's not. Can't you tell that she's pissing off Casey by drinking in front of her? He's like, it's just life, guys. You know, you're going to run into people that drink. You can't, you can't hide from it. Whatever. We end up going to a movie that night. I said, I don't remember what. They say that they left something in the car. We were at the Sherman Oaks Gallery. If you ever seen the movie Fast Times at Richmond High, it was filmed at this mall. We were eating at the Cheesecake Factory before it. Same Cheesecake Factory that I went out to dinner with Nick and Karina and Nico the first night that I'd gotten out of prison. And... um they end up going to the car because they said they forgot something. I gave them the keys, whatever. We waited for like a good 30 minutes. 30 minutes goes by, right? Case is like, we're going to miss the movie. Text him. 
text him, no response. Call him. Call him, go straight to voicemail. So we 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 kind of like come to this decision where we're going to go see what they're doing at the car. What the fuck's taking them so long? Uh, okay. Sorry. Just got a text message from Mr. Mickey Avalon. Um, I've been having a lot of fun writing his book. So anyway, so we walk up to the car and it's just completely hazy from smoke. They're in the back seat smoking fucking weed. I felt like I was, I got cheated on or something. I opened the door, all this weed smoke just trails out. And I was like, what are you doing? And Jeff looks at me, he's like, oh, dude, it's not what it looks like. I was like, it's exactly what it looks like. You're smoking fucking weed in my car, man. You know that I'm, so this is life or death for me, bro. How could you do this to me? Take a fucking Uber and get out of here. He's like, you changed so much, man. It's just weed. I'm sorry I'm in love. He's like crying. I'm like, shut up, bitch. And he left. That was a, that was strike two with this with Callan. Periodically, Jeff would send me like videos of like her sucking his dick and shit. I'm like whatever, I'd save them. Just you know, because I'm because that's what I do. Eventually, we made up, but there was like a period where I didn't talk to Jeff for a long time because of his weed smoking. I don't remember what happened, but Callan and Jeff broke up at a certain point. They got together around the same time that I got together with Casey, and they started having relationship problems, right? So Jeff and I had had a falling out because I caught him smoking weed in my car. I took personal offense to that because I felt like that was just like, oh, oh. You don't care about my sobriety, do you? Do you know what grass can lead to, man? It can lead to other drugs and stuff. It's a gateway drug, Jeff. You're a piece of shit. I just turned into a total weirdo sober Nazi. But we made up. And eventually, Callan ends up cheating on Jeff with the same dude that she had left to be with Jeff for originally. So he ends up calling me and he's, you know, he's in tears and he's like, Calvin left me. And I was like, what happened? Is she working as a mascot at Disneyland now? Hanging out fucking acorns to kids with that frightening chipmunk face that she has? She cheated on me with her boyfriend. I'm like, how? Her... Wow, dude. And that was pretty much the end of having to hear about Cal. Now, Jeff went through this period where he was heartbroken, right? He was just heartbroken over um, this girl for a long time. And I had to console him over the phone, just like he's done for me as I've gone through various breakups because breakups suck. And I definitely understand. That's why I went to Preston's house last weekend because I was trying to be there for him. And that backfired big time for me. What in the fuck? Why is there a cigarette in my coffee? <sighs> kind of made it taste better, to be honest. So anyway, um, so that was probably when she cheated on Jeff. It was probably in like 2015, 14. I don't know. She ends up moving back to Orange County. She, I think, Newport Beach. And I never talked to her again at that point. Okay. There's a reason why I went into all of this with her. So now fast forward. The year is 2017. I have just checked myself in to rehab with Karina into that detox that Preston got me into. I didn't know if Preston was legitimately sober or not at the time. He said that he was, but he did not look sober. He had like 
fucking burn holes all over his sweaters and shit. He's like, no, nah, you know, I've just, I've just been painting and shit. I'm like, you don't paint what the fuck. So when we end up going to this rehab, I told you, and I, I'd gone into great deal explaining that this was a cult like rehab. Selena is the one that runs it. The name of the rehab Preston told me, he said, put that bitch on blast. It's called South Orange County Detox and is in San Clemente, California. The owner's name is Selena. She fucks the clients, the uh, staff there drinks, uses drugs. It's very abusive. She, that's the place where she, um, she had, uh, she had opened it with her husband and the first client that they ever had. She sucked his dick, got caught. The guy that she opened it with, her husband, went down to Mexico, drank himself to death, left a suicide note, basically blamed it on her. It's like, yeah, I'm killing myself because I you were sucking our only client's dick, you fucking bitch. From the get-go. When we got to that rehab, it was all bad. Karina was flirting with the staff when we first got there. Um, Selena saw how jealous I got. So she would intentionally try to get me jealous um, and try to get Karina away from me as much as possible. And then we ultimately got caught kissing and Karina was jerking me off while we were watching Shawshank Redemption. We end up getting kicked out of this place, right? I think that's where we were at last time, but I had not gone into the backstory of Callan uh, because that's an important piece of the Henry puzzle that I'm about to tell you. So we end up, I don't remember if we got kicked out or if I had gotten kicked out. Maybe, I, I think what had happened is that I got kicked out, but they were going to let Karina stay. And there was no way being the jealous, insecure fuck that I was that I was going to let her stay at this rehab alone. And she's like, but I need it. Well, you told me that it was life or death. I was like, I don't care. I'd rather you die than fucking cheat on me. I'm just, if we're being honest. And we talked, remember, we talked about honesty and therapy. So it's either come with me or die. And she's like, okay, I'm going to come with you. It doesn't even make sense. So we end up leaving. I remember I have my mom's car. And Karina and I talked about this particular storyline after I started talking about it, because there was always this discrepancy about how I got Henry's phone number. He gave me his phone number back at the Riviera complex right by my parents' house, but I wrote down a fake number. I'm not sure how I had his number, but I did. Somehow I had it, and I was able to reach out to him, because when we left rehab, pretty much my parents and Karina's parents had gotten together and said that they were not going to help us anymore. Karina couldn't move back in with her family. My parents weren't going to give me any more resources. We we're basically going to be like homeless unless we got treatment. So my whole plan, the thing that I had thought about the whole time, is trying to break into this, this guy's house so that I could get $3,500 from Henry. And that was probably just drug addict delusional thinking thinking that this guy could actually do that or would do it or I didn't even know what the reason was but I was down for it so we're in Orange County right after we leave and we're in this town called San Clemente and I had only been using heroin for about a week so I wasn't like too sick they had transitioned me on to Subutex and we were coming off alcohol but it wasn't that bad because remember I had gone to Lompoc for three months. That's when I met Big Meech. And in that time, I had dried out for alcohol. I remember I kicked Well, I was like, you know, uh, shackled to the hospital bed. And the point is, is I wasn't physically dependent enough on anything where I couldn't leave a detox facility like that and feel okay. So when we left, the first thing that we did, we had, we had like no money. When we left, right? And we ended up going to this Trader Joe's parking lot in San Clemente. Trader Joe's is a grocery store. I don't know if you guys have that, but we have them all over California, all over Southern California, at least. I don't even know if it's national or whatever. I think, I think it is. We get to this parking lot and I'm telling Karina that she needs to steal a bottle of wild turkey because that had become one of our major role, like moves, you know, at, at that 
time. When we didn't have money, when we didn't, when I couldn't spange up enough shit, Karina would go into Trader Joe's and she would steal a fifth of wild turkey whiskey, walk out, we'd get drunk in a park, we'd fuck, sometimes I'd bend her over a tree branch or something, we'd have sex, we'd get drunk, and that was that. But usually when Karina would steal alcohol, she was already wasted, so she had the courage to do so. We had been in detox for a few days, so we were both not on anything. I tell Karina, like, I just pull, I didn't even, it's the kind of thing where I pulled into this Trader Joe's parking lot and I didn't even tell Karina what my intentions were. But in my mind, I knew that she was going to steal this fifth of whiskey. We were going to get drunk. Then we were going to make it back to Santa Barbara. And then I was going to go and try to go on this mission for Henry, try to get the $3,500, live off that for a little bit, live in motels. And when you're living that kind of lifestyle, you're kind of just living in the moment. Like, nothing else matters. Like, I'm like, all right, if I can just get this money, if I can just get this motel, if we can just but fuck now, we're going to be okay. So we end up getting into this parking lot, and I tell Karina, I say, look. She's like, what are we doing in this parking lot? I was like, I need you to, to go in there, and I need you to jack a bottle of wild turkey. I was like, I don't think we can come up with, like, a very balanced or well-thought-out plan unless we're fucking drunk. She's like, wait a second. I'm not really feeling stealing anything right now. I don't need it. Isn't that the point why we just went to fucking rehab so that we could stop drinking? She's like, this is exactly what Selena and the staff said that you were going to do. That if I left with you, that you were going to try to bring me down and you're going to get try to get me to drink again. So we end up getting this huge fight. Karina gets out of the car and runs away from me. Ah, I'm like, fuck. Running around. This is the summer. This is like July of 2017. It's scorching hot in Orange County. We're in San Clemente, which is a beach town, but it was like sweltering. Like there's sweat running down me. Karina's just running down the street and I'm chasing after her and I finally get closer and she's like, no, it's the get away from me. She's like, help. He's trying to get me to steal alcohol from Trader Joe's. I'm like, why would you fucking yell that? Shut up. Stop chasing her. And I, you know, when there have been situations like that where Karina would try to put me on blast like that in public, I would stop what I was doing. And I would just go back and try to get away from her because I didn't want to get arrested. Now, remember, I was on federal probation at that time anyway. I just go back. Hmm. I just go back to my car and I sit in the driver's seat hoping that she's going to come back. Feel like shit. Like I said, it's hot, sweating. The air conditioner was busted in my mom's car. I'm just sitting in the front and I drifted into like some like peaceful sleep. I knew that Karina would come back. Back then, I used to make fun of her and I used to say that she was a boomerang slut. You know, I was like, no matter what you do, or no matter what I do to you, no matter how fucked up I am to you, you'll always come back because you're a boomerang slut. She's like, I am, I am a boomerang slut. I know. I don't care. I love you, poopy daddy. No, she didn't talk about that. I wake up to tapping. Ta, 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 ta. I like come to, of course, I think it's police. And I see Karina and she's just looking at me and she's like, babe, open the door. I'd lock the, I'd lock the, the BMW, my mom's BMW door. So I open the door. She gives me a hug and she's like, oh my God, this guy, this homeless guy with a beard was asking if he could eat me out. It was so fucking disgusting. And I realized that I just don't want to not be with you. I was like, well, that's what made you realize that you wanted to be with me. She's like, totally. I was like, all right, well, I'll take it, whatever. So she's like, do you really want me to steal alcohol? It's like, yeah, babe. I was like, I don't know about you, but I could use a drink right now and we don't have any money. And she's like, okay, I'll go with you. but you have to go in the store with me and I'll steal it because she had a big purse. She had like a big Louis Vuitton purse. And that was always the way that we were able to steal stuff. She's a hot girl. 
big Louis Vuitton purse. People don't expect her to put a bottle of wild turkey into that bag. So she wanted me to go with her into the store. I was like, okay, whatever, I'm down for it. So I end up, we end up walking into this Trader Joe's. Now remember, like we'd both been outside scorching hot. It was just so nice to be in an air conditioned Trader Joe's. And so before we actually were gonna like steal the bottle, we decided to walk around because Trader Joe's gives free samples. You know, they go get like, a little trisket with like a slice of cheese on it. And when you're like homeless or when you're like on some sort of drug and alcohol run, those little snacks that you get, like sometimes you can talk them into giving you like a bunch of them. Like you go up to them and you're like, hey, can I try the trisket with ch with uh, with cheese? Oh, superb. Can I get another? You eat like another one. And then like, before you know it, you've eaten like 10, 15 of these. When you're an alcoholic or drug addict and you're on a run like that, eating a bunch of samples can actually fill you up. So we were doing that for a little bit. And finally, we end up going to the alcohol section. I'm like, just do it. And she's like, okay, well, cover for me. I was like, no, the whole point of you doing it is because I'm on federal probation. If I get caught, I'm going to go to prison. If you get caught, you're going to get a fucking ticket. There's a big difference between the two, Karina. She's like, okay, fine. Go wait by the front of the store. I just, I don't know. It's different when I'm sober. I feel weird about it. I feel uncomfortable. So I started giving her shit, you know? And I was like, I was like, you're so selfish. We're like getting in a fight about this. Like in the store. I'm like, you're so selfish. If I wasn't on probation, I would, I, you know that I would fucking jack the bottle. Just do it, Karina. You never contribute anything to this relationship, which was, couldn't be further from the truth. At that point, she was the one that had had a job pretty much the entire time. She was the one that had pretty much always contributed financially, except for the few times that I'd stolen my parents' credit card. I was just a piece of shit back then. So I go stand by the front of the store. And I start waiting for her. I don't know how long I waited, but it had to have been like 10 or 15 minutes. It was a long time. And finally, I see her running towards the front. And she's got like three dudes in Hawaiian shirts. That's like what the Trader Joe's uniform is. And they're chasing her. And I'm like, oh shit, she got caught. And like, she runs right up to me and just grabs me, right? And these guys are like pulling at her purse. And I was like, hey man, get your fucking hands off my girlfriend. And they're like, no, she stole from us shoplifter and they're all yelling and now the security's coming and it was just this big old commotion she got caught putting the bottle into her purse and i was like what do i have to do with this they're like you're not with her and i'm like no and she's like that's my boyfriend he made me do it i'm like are you fucking serious they're like all right well we're gonna have to detain you guys there's like at least five of these employees and there's a security guard there was like no way that we could run away from them. I was so pissed off that she brought me into it. But you know, looking back now in retrospect, I was the piece of shit that was like trying to put her up to do this. So they end up bringing, it was so embarrassing. Like all these people in the store, like looking at us, we both just look like shot out. Like the security guard just has like this handle of like, you know, wild turkey in his hand it looked like we were going to do some like sort of like genre gangbang that you'd see on the internet they take us to this back room and they're like pretty much interrogating us they're just like asking us questions because they're telling us that they're about to call the police The guy that was the main security guard was this, like, bald black guy. And he was cool. He was, like, a cool security guard. He's like, all right, if you can just tell me why you guys were trying to steal from our location, we might be able to circumvent the police from coming down here and arresting y'all. Because here at Trader Joe's, we like to give people second chances. I felt like I was at, like, some sort of, like, um, timeshare fucking conference or something. Like he, I mean, this guy was like a great salesman, you know, he basically just wanted us to make statements. Now, looking back, 
I think that they were trying to gather statements because when they called the police, they wanted to like have these statements to give to them because they wanted to press charges on us. I don't know, whatever the case was, I think they were like trying to play good cop with us. So I decided, I don't know why, but like I just had this like moment of like, I like regretted the fact that I put Karina up to this in the first place. I was already on federal probation. I already knew that I was fucked. And I was like, look, you want to know the truth? He's like, more than anything in the world, all these employees are looking at us. We're like in this back room with all these boxes. There's like a chair. We're both sitting down at the chair. Karina's crying. She has her head. She didn't want me telling the story too, for some reason. I don't know why. I think it's because she's like a mom now and she just feels embarrassed about it. But she was crying. And I said, hey, look, we just got out of, you know, drug rehab. Uh, Karina, she's my fiance. Her brother got killed tragically. Uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but she is Hispanic. Her family is comprised of mostly gang members and her brother died in a gang shooting. We both enrolled into a rehab down here and our insurance ran out. They kicked us out on the street. We didn't have our medications. We're coming off alcohol. You know, she, is basically consumed by this tragedy that just happened because of her gang banging Hispanic brother. I had to keep like saying that he was Hispanic. Trina just was like rolling her eyes. And I was like, and that's what happened. We came here because we're coming off alcohol. We didn't know what to do. We're out of money. We're sorry. Please don't press charges. Now the black guy, security guard, he's like, well, he's like, it comes down to this. He's like, we have the supervisor here and she makes all the calls and she's the one that's going to decide if she wants to press charges or not. And if she does, then it's a police matter that we have no control over. I was like, I thought you just said that if I told you the truth and our side of the story that you weren't going to press charges. And he's like, well, you know, I may have fibbed a bit in saying that we wouldn't press charges, but, you know, there is a possibility that we won't. Like, fuck, dude. We're sitting back there. Karina's like, oh my God, my life's ruined. I'm like, your life's ruined. I was like, dude, this is shoplifting. I'm on federal probation. I'll probably get like seven years for this dumb shit. So we wait in there for like a good 30 minutes. Security guard. It's like one of those things where the security guard's talking to like the other Trader Joe staff, they're cracking jokes. And we're just the pieces of shit that was trying to steal alcohol from them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Callan comes walking in. She is the supervisor of that particular Trader Joe's in San Clemente. The same girl that dated Jeff. Same girl that I had all of those problems with before. The one where I kicked her out of my parents' house because we had gotten in that argument because she wanted wine. Second time we got her smoking weed in the car at the movie theater. This is the third time I had even seen her. She was already broken up with Jeff. And she's the super... Out of all fucking people, she is the supervisor of this Trader Joe's that we just got caught stealing alcohol from. And our fate is basically in her hands. And we will get into what happens next in the next installment of the Henry series. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate you all. Let's have a much better month for the month of May. Palabra.